I'm Kevin Kelly. I'm Senior Maverick at Wired Magazine. I want to talk about what technology wants. And I have three points. The first one begins with the world without technology. This was a world where humans only lived to an average age of 35. It was a very, very difficult life. Sometimes people talk about hunter-gatherers having banker hours, well, this is totally wrong. It was a very severe and challenging environment. It was helped by the fact that humans invented technologies from the very, very beginning of our start. Hammers, swords, knives for the claws that we did not have. And then one of the first things we humans did was to eliminate most of the megafauna animals throughout the world, easy meat. There were thousands of species and this changed the entire landscape of the planet once they were removed. Um, the animals that we didn't kill off, we tended to domesticate. Um, wolves into dogs, um, goats and pigs very, very quickly, 10,000 years ago. And, but really the very first animal that we domesticated was ourselves. We changed ourselves. And we changed ourselves in many ways, including um, taming fire to make it into a food technology so that we could cook. Cooking became an external stomach that we could process nutrition in a way that we could not otherwise. And that nutrition changed our jaws, changed our teeth, changed our brains. Once we domesticated herding animals, we could milk them and we very quickly evolved adult lactose tolerance within a few thousand years. So we marched on with this new technology and changing ourselves and we settled the entire globe at the rate of about two kilometers a year on average. And immediately, very long before the industrial age, we started to change the climate of the planet through the eradication of megafauna, through fire, through other means. So this became the most powerful force in the world. First, we changed ourselves, then we changed the plants and animals around us, we changed the environment, and we changed the entire planet. And in that way, humanity is our greatest invention. And of course, we're not done yet. So almost from the beginning, we had this very paradox, which is that we are both creators and the created. We are both the parent and the child at the same time. We are the master and the servant. We are the shaper and the shaped at the same time. And so the dilemma that we commonly have right now about whether we are being run by technology or running technology will forever be the paradox of our lives. Into a thousand years in the future, we will still have the same dilemma, the same paradox that we are both the creator and the created. And this two-faced aspect of technology is essential to our understanding because it's interwoven. Our humanity is something we invented and through our invention, we have, we have made other technologies. And so this, this is an integral part of ourselves. We are a techno species and that's the number one point I wanna make. We are integral with technology we ourselves are technological. The second point is that before Darwin, uh, when naturalists and biologists would go out to collect things in the world that they found, living creatures, plants, animals, living organisms, they just made curiosity cabinets. They made, they made catalogs on them. There was no theory about how they were connected together. It was just one organism after another. We are until recently been very similar in the technological realm because we have a parade of different technological inventions one after another, but we haven't really had a very good theory or understanding of what connects them together, how they're related to each other, what they mean, how they come about. Even the very concept of technology is very recent and we're still kind of grappling with what a good definition is. One definition that I really like is that technology is anything that was invented after you were born. Because most of the stuff in our lives that surrounds us right now is technology that's been around for a long time, but we don't think of it as technology. It's concrete pavements, it's lead, or it's copper pipes, it's switches, it's 
wooden shelters. These are all technologies, even things like calendars and libraries, even our law are technologies, but we don't think of them in that way because they're old. We think of technology as a new stuff. Danny Hill says this technology is the stuff that doesn't work yet. And that's sort of a, a good popular definition. But in fact, technology is a very recent idea itself. Even though it has been around for a long time, we haven't really perceived it until very recently. Even in the 1950s and before, it was hardly ever raised. In fact, the term, especially in English, um, wasn't invented until 1829, centuries after it had been around and in, in use, but it wasn't really even apparent to us. I think technology is a cosmic force that has been around longer than even humans have. It is a force that began at the Big Bang, okay? It began at the Big Bang, and at the Big Bang, what's happened since then, and what's the universal rule of all physics, is, is that entropy has been increasing, meaning that heat death has been increasing. Everything runs down. And it's not to like a blackness, it's to a kind of a grayness, because there's the point of high entropy means there's no difference. Everything is flat, it's the same. And that is the general drift of the universe, except in a few little corners, a few little spaces here and there, and few is relative because there are actually billions of them, but planets would form. And actually, before planets, particles would form, and those particles will form molecules, and these formations would gather through gravity into stars, and stars are self-organizing. The more there is, the more they attract, and so this self-organizational principle would eventually make planets and um, higher, uh, heavier elements. All these things are a f like an examples of self-organization. And self-organization kind of runs slightly counter to entropy. In this local area, we see increasing order over time. And this entropy that decreases is what I call exotropy, this increasing order, accelerates the amount of entropy made in the local area, and that's how it works. So this exotropy is self-organization, and technology is an accelerated version of that exotropy. It's an accelerated version of what goes through life. It's an accelerated version of what happens when the primeval um, universe organized into matter and molecules and stars. And this thread, this chain of matter forming and then stars forming and then planets forming and spiraling galaxies forming and then life, at least on this planet, forming and life producing technology is this chain of self-organization that runs through the universe. And so technology in that sense is an extension of that self-organizing force that began at the Big Bang and ran through life. And one of the examples of this is the energy density, which has been increasing all along through these different stages. And it's the highest, meaning the amount of energy that can flow through the smallest amount of matter in the um, smallest amount of time has been increasing. And technology is the most energy dense in the entire universe. Your laptop is the most energy dense thing that we know of, even more than a star. So there is a great arc to technology running through the cosmos. And it began the Big Bang, ran through the origins of stars and galaxies, and then planets, and then life, and then minds, and will go beyond us. That is the general story of technology. We are just in the middle of that story. And we could say to a first approximation that what technology wants is what evolution wants because it's the same force accelerated. So the natural question would be, well, what does evolution want? Well, evolution also has uh, trajectories. That's controversial. I wouldn't really say it has a destiny, but it has directories, it has directions. And those directions are from simple to the complex. It goes from sameness to diversity. Evolution moves from general things to specialization. It moves from independence to mutualism. 
It runs from dumbness to sentience. And it runs from things that are very hard to evolve to things that are very easy to evolve. So that's the general trends in evolution. And those are the trends that we see in technology itself. So just as there is huge diversity in the living world, we see the same kind of explosion of diversity in the invented, manufactured, technological world. We see the same kind of specialization that happens in life where you have a general purpose cell and then over time, a body like ours might have 57 different kinds of specialized cells like heart cells or skeleton cells or muscle cells. We see the same thing in technology where you might have a general hammer that does everything to specialized hammers, to a camera that can do anything to a specialized camera like a high-speed camera or maybe an underwater camera or maybe a high-speed underwater camera. And so that general movement is something we see in technology. We see this huge diversity and we can even follow kind of a lineage of how variations are made and passed on almost in the way of this genealogical chart of the shapes of armor, medieval armor, followed what looks like a um, taxonomical tree. So I would, I would go so far as to say there are six kingdoms of life, roughly, in today's understanding, and that technology, in a certain sense, is the seventh kingdom that came out of the minds of humans. Okay, it's, it's the seventh kingdom of life. And this seventh kingdom observes the same general trends that the other six kingdoms do. This movement towards ubiquity and diversity, towards specialization, towards complexity. It's the same thrust of this self-organizing force. So this seventh kingdom of life, that is technological, is following the same things. It wants the same things that life wants, which is very, very important because that suggests to us something important about the world that we're inhabiting technologically that is compatible with life. Now, if you take a hand, ancient, hominoid, stone flint hammer, it's about roughly the same size and weight and shape as a mouse uh, for a computer. But I could probably make the stone hammer if I tried hard and maybe practiced for a couple of weeks. But under no circumstances could I ever make a computer mouse. It's beyond me because it requires hundreds of other technologies that I'm not a master of. It is part of a system of technology I call that system the technium. The technium is not a particular single technology, it's all technologies supporting each other together. So to make a saw today, you need a hammer. And to make a hammer, you need a saw. And that spread further is the way that works. So the mouse needs hammer, saw, factories, electronics. It needs thousands of other technologies. And most of the things we make today are codependent on the other technologies around them. That system is called the technium. And any system, including the technium, has its own agenda. That's the nature of systems. And just as plants want light, want is a very loaded English word, they move towards light, they bend towards light, they don't consciously want it in a conscious way, but they gravitate to it, Technology also has its tendencies where it wants to go even though it's not conscious. It has a bias, has an urgency, has a tendency. So it may just want power to, to run itself. Um, I've seen a robot block myself uh, or uh, try to get around me as I was blocking it from its um, power cord. So even though it's not conscious, they can have a want. And these are not specific destinations, these are general tendencies. Imagine for the moment rain falling down a river valley and the thousands and millions of raindrops are falling down, but the individual path of any one of those raindrops is completely stochastic, is random. We cannot predict it, but we can predict its direction, which is downward for certainty. We can't say specifically where it's going to go, but it's going to go down. That's 
the level of what we're talking about. It's kind of like the water in a river valley as it meanders around. We can't predict which part of the river it's going through, but we can say it's going to stay in the valley. So these valleys, these general directions, are what we can talk about. And so in the, I would say that as soon as a civilization has electronic wires and silicon chips and radio waves, it's going to make the Internet. It's going to make Wi-Fi. It's inevitable. Okay, and so these long-term trends can't be predicted even though the specifics can't. It's sort of at the level of, uh, we can say, if you have a planet with a gravity like the, uh, like the Earth, that you're going to have quadrupeds on it because that is a stable configuration physically, but you won't be able to predict zebras, which are much too specific. Okay, so the form, not the species. So we could say that once you have telephones, they're inevitable, but the iPhone's not. The internet was inevitable, but Twitter was not. So those are the general trends that we can talk about moving forward. And I would say, like right now, that we're going to, AI is inevitable, even though the specific character and who controls it and who owns it, how it's run, is not at all inevitable. And they make those decisions, those choices make a big difference to us. So. My definition of technology is anything useful produced by a mind. It could be the mind of a beaver or a bird as they make nests and dams, but it's also all the stuff that we make. And it is a mind thing. Technology is like thinking. It's a kind of thinking. And if I right now was to talk and give you a bad idea, you're not going to counsel me to stop thinking. You just say, well, that's a bad idea, stop thinking. But that's what we tend to do with technology. When bad technology comes up, people say, I want less of it. Let's turn down the technology. Let's stop the technology. Let's have less technology. But a better, a better response is if we have a technology, say, incandescent bulbs that run on tungsten that are very hot, waste a lot of energy, we say, okay, that's a bad idea. Let's have less light. No, that's like having, that's like thinking less. Let's have a better idea. Let's make a better light bulb. Let's make better technology. Okay, so the proper response to a technology that is harmful, technology that doesn't work yet, technology that maybe is in some ways um, causes harm for the environment, is not less of it, but better of it. An example would be um, DDT which was turned out to be um, sprayed uh, as a pesticide for plantations and farms. And it was horrible. It caused tremendous ecological um, devastation. But the problem was it was doing the wrong job. So DDT sprayed around, in small doses sprayed around a household, is the most effective malarial um, deterrent that we know of, saving hundreds of millions of lives a year. So it needed a better job. It was, we could make a better version of it. So better ideas is what technology is. And it follows in the same thrust of all the things that life wanted, technology wants as well. It wants to become more complex. It wants to become more diverse. It wants to become more specialized. It wants to become more ubiquitous. It wants to become smarter over time, and it wants to evolve faster and faster. Technology wants clean water just like life does. We need clean water to make these highly specific manufacturing processes. It, it kind of wants the same thing that life wants. And in fact, we have never been able to make, we, or I should say, we have always been able to make a greener version of whatever we make. So we know that we can make greener and greener, more, more naturally compatible things because it is inherently like nature. So, so this is my second point, which is that technology is the acceleration of nature. It's not in opposition to it. It's compatible with it because it comes from it. And so it's in many ways just the extension of nature. And therefore, it's always within our powers to help direct it become more greener because we have not yet found any technology that we could not make greener. So the third point is that technologies generally create almost as many 
problems as they solve. New technologies create new problems. The new technologies of artificial intelligence will create fantastical new problems that we've never had before. And they will bring many new benefits. The trick that we want is to try to create 1% more than we ever destroy in a year. So, so we, it's not a very high bar. It's, we, we just need to be 1% better than our worst. That means that maybe most of the stuff that we make may be garbage. It may be trash. We may have to throw it out. But that's okay as long as we have 1% more better in a year than we have trash, we can make civilization. Because that 1% difference between problems and solutions is all that we need to make civilization because 1% compounded hourly or by daily or by the year is what civilization, is what civilization builds civilization. That's almost the definition of civilization is the accumulation of 1% more that we create than we destroy every year. And the problem with 1% is that it's almost invisible. We can look around and we can hardly see 1%. That's why the world can seem to be terrible and in great trouble if it's only 1% difference in the good and the bad. But that whole 1% progress, so to speak, is really only visible in retrospect. We have to look behind us to see. We have to look into history. We have to look into the past to see the fact that progress and that 1% difference is real. But that is what technology gives us. It brings us differences, options, possibilities, choices, freedoms, diversity. These are all the things. These, these are why hundreds of millions of humans every year in recent decades have moved from their villages into the cities where it may not be the nicest place to live because what they get out of that or choices and possibilities they don't have at home. At home, they may be in a village that has organic food, beautiful vistas. They have a strong sense of family and community support. They know who they are. But they leave to go into the city where things are uncertain, where um, it may be grimy and, and uh, gritty, but they could be a mathematician, they could be a ballerina, which they could not be at home. They'd have to be a farmer or a farmer's wife. So they're moving into the cities because the cities are possibility factories, because they have all the choices that technology had, brings us. And that is what technology gives us in the end. Even though it may produce more problems, they are new problems. And each new problem is a possibility that did not exist before, and a possibility to make good in a new way. So this explosion of possibilities is what technology is moving towards, is what it has brought us so far, and it's what is going to deliver us in the future. And I want to tell one story uh, at the end, and that is the story of possibilities. I I imagine, for the moment, that Mozart, the great musical genius, was born 2,000 years before he was born. He, he would have been maybe a farmer, or maybe he was a hunter-gatherer. There were no musical instruments like a piano or a symphony for his genius to take root and flower. So the world would have missed his genius, his musical genius, none of that stuff would have ever, any of his composers, composers and symphonies would have ever been composed. And, of course, Mozart himself would have missed that same genius as well and that opportunity for his art. And um, we could also imagine the painter Van Gogh, um, who maybe he was born 5,000 years before oil paints were invented in canvas, in brushes, and what a loss to the world that would have been to miss um, his genius and, of course, 
the genius that um, he would have missed himself, the pleasure of painting. And we can extend that to, you know, a, a filmmaker like um, Alfred Hitchcock. And if he had been born thousands of years before we had invented the technology of cinema and all that would have been missing because of his genius. So what that means is that every generation we're inventing new technologies and there are more people born who have a chance to express their genius because the technology is ready for them. So that means that someone like my son, who was 10 or 12 at this picture, uh, is waiting for us collectively to invent a technology, the possibility for his genius to be expressed because maybe it's a holographic display, maybe it's something else that we haven't yet have that we're about to make that will allow that genius to be expressed. So somewhere in the world today, there may be a Shakespeare of their time and she's waiting for us collectively as humans to invent the tools to share for her genius to shine. So we, in a certain sense, have a moral obligation to keep inventing new technologies and new possibilities so with the hope that every person born on the planet and yet unborn may have a chance to use their special mix of talents in a way that would require this technology and we can supply that to them and they can therefore express it and share it. And that's why even though when we're working on technology that may seem something that we may throw away, it may seem disposable, it may seem like it's something that's not important, it may seem that it's only commerce or it's in some ways just part of capitalism, that's okay because it's actually even because it's bigger than that. Because when we are making, inventing new things, we are participating in that long arc that I'm talking about. This long arc that goes through from the beginning of the Big Bang and goes through the cosmos and through life and us. That long arc of increasing the possibilities in the universe. That's the long arc that we're participating in when we make and invent something new. Is we are part of this process of expanding the possibilities, the choices, the opportunities in the universe and especially for other people. And by the way, we're also expanding it for ourselves as a species. We may become more things than we are right now and we will so that's the possibility space that we're expanding and that's what technology is about it's about this long arc through the cosmos of expanding the possibilities making them more and more and more possible and that is the great thing that technology gives us it increases possibilities so um the three things about technology. One is that we are techno species. We're completely integrated. We are technological in many senses. We have long left the period where we're dependent on technology. We are wholly dependent on technology and forevermore. The second thing is that technology is a natural process. It's an acceleration of the natural self-organizing force in the universe. It is compatible with nature with our choice. We can make it so. And the third thing is that this is a movement through the universe of increasing the possibilities for all beings, for all things. And when we participate in making new technologies, we are expanding that possibility space for all. And that's the good stuff about technology. And that is what technology wants. So thank you for your attention.